I'm Martin Chigno, I'm the director of the Knowledge Media Design Institute, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome today uh, Professor Katharina Radke from the uh, University of Michigan. I probably murdered your name there. Uh, <laughs> she's from Hamburg, okay? So she's, she did her PhD in Switzerland, and uh, she's now at the I School in Michigan doing some very interesting work on Lab in the Wild. And uh, I'm really glad uh, to have you here today. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks so much. Thanks. So I'm going to use this uh, microphone in addition. I hope everybody can hear me, um, just so that I can kind of save my voice a little bit. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming and, um, and attending this talk. I'm going to talk today about a topic that is actually only a side strand of my research, I would say. So, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I usually do in my daily life. Um, so I do conduct these large-scale experiments. And I do them with the help of Lab in the Wild, my online platform. But I also use them just collecting samples on the internet, like from companies and so on, and then analyzing them. And I do that to conduct cultural comparisons. That's actually my main goal of my research, I guess. Um, I'm really fascinated by differences and how people interact with technology. And once I've analyzed these data sets, what I usually do is I um, try to look at how that influences how we interact with technology. And then I build technology that automatically adapts to these cultural differences. And as you can see, the circle kind of continues because I have to refine, um, collect more data, and so on, and refine the technology. Um, so that's usually what my research is about. But uh, the first time that I came, became really interested in this topic was actually um, after I just finished my master's thesis. Um, and I went to Rwanda um, to a computer lab at the National University of Rwanda. So this is me uh, with a bunch of students in Rwanda. And this was in 2006, so quite a long while ago. And I did that um, to work for a company that was producing software, e-learning software, for, an agricultural, um, for the agricultural advisors in Rwanda. So those are people who go around in Rwanda and teach farmers about agricultural methods and so on. My job was only to build the software for them. And because I had just finished my master's, I thought, yeah, I'm like really well equipped to do this. I know everything about usability. I know what good design is. Um, I know what, to, how, what programming is, so I can just do this. Um, so I, I started looking at what they actually needed. I did a lot normal requirements analysis. And I came up with a, um, several prototypes, and one of them was this one. Um, again, I had several variations, but I just presented them with this one. And um, I noticed they absolutely hated it. So they really didn't like it. They thought it was too gray and white, too plain. Um, it wasn't enough color for them. It wasn't playful enough. But even worse, um, it left them way too much freedom in interacting with the software. So like similar to the MOOCs from today, um, they just didn't know where to click first. There's so much that the software offered. There was so much learning content. They didn't really know how to approach it. And <clears throat> so I, I worked with them for quite a while, for actually six months. And we iterated on this design and went from one to the other, back and forth, um, <clears throat> discussed. I went into schools, um, looked at how they interact with software, how they interact with the teachers, um, how they, they have these little, um, they had mobile phones already back then. So they were interacting quite a lot with mobile phones in their daily life already. I looked at how they do that. Um, so I really tried to find out how could I design the software to be more usable for them, more intuitive, and also more appealing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so again, this took me about six months of time to adapt the software to be, I would say, almost perfect for what they needed. They were really happy with it afterwards. They used it. Um, they were also much faster using it. So it seems to be a success. And it was actually for me the first time that I realized, wow, like culture really influences how we interact with computers and what we prefer, what, what our preferences are. And I couldn't really believe it, but then did another study during my PhD where I um, designed a to-do list application, and I gave them this um, people. I gave people this software, and it's just a it's a web application where you can just create simple to-dos. So, for example, um, remind me to get milk tonight. And I um, I wanted to know would everybody like this, and can can everybody interact with this, or should we adapt it to other cultural backgrounds? And so instead of just giving them this software, I gave them paper prototypes. So I designed several versions of this software and um, gave them this paper, these paper snippets. And they could basically build their own software system. And this was also nice because then they didn't really have to have much computer 
background, right? They didn't have to actually know how to interact with the software itself. They were just able to envision what it would be like. And I went to Rwanda, Switzerland, and Thailand, those three countries, and looked at how they would build the software and later compared it. And now if you look at these three outcomes, they're completely different. So um, it was actually really fascinating to me to see how in Thailand pretty much everyone liked this uh, pink design, this very bright colors, even males, it didn't matter. It was just a very popular color scheme. And they had a lot of choice, so, right? Um, but they were very, like, they agreed within the country. They always really very much agreed on what they liked. In Rwanda, they really liked that wizard on the side that you can see in the, um, this, this yellow bar there. So that's a wizard that walks them through the application and tells them what to do at any given time. And they really loved it. And asked, when I asked them about that, they were saying, yeah, we also really like this Microsoft Office Clippy. And it was surprising to me, because, <laughs> like, <laughs> Right? <laughs> we don't really like it. <laughs> but uh, for them, I think it's just a body. Um, it's, it's something that, even though they might not actually follow the advice, it's something that's there and interacts with them while they use the computer. It makes it more fun. Um, so a lot of it is about the design. A lot of it is also about the functionality. But it really made me realize how different we are in our preferences and so on. Now, um, if you look at the HCI literature, human-computer interaction literature, you will notice that if you want to design for a certain country or a certain population, there's really not much there that you can build on. So there aren't any design guidelines that tell you if you design for user population X, Y, just do this. And I was really not happy about that because I wanted to design for the entire world, not just for one country and not just for um, Germans or Swiss, Swiss users, um, which I could probably relate to best being from Germany myself. Um, but so the, the reason people, or I guess the, um, the fact that we just, or the situation at the moment in HCI and also in psychology and behavioral economics and related fields is that we just base most of our study on American undergrads. So um, actually 96% of our um, study participants in in behavioral economics and psychology at the moment are WEIRD participants. So WEIRD stands for Westerners, Educated, Industrialized, Rich and Democratic Participants. And that's because we use subject pools um, that are convenient samples, right? Like often we use American undergrads, uh, North American undergrads in your case, um, to just run our studies. And they are there, they often have to take those studies because they get cred study credit for it. Um, but that also means that we base all our findings on these study populations. And that wouldn't really be a problem, except that obviously most people aren't weird. So we really only represent this tiny little part of the world's population. And if we only design for ourselves, we're never going to get the rest of the world to use our technology. Um, I think the reason why this is the case, why we're not studying more people and broader samples in general, is that studying less weird participants is really hard. I told you my, my own experience of spending six months in Rwanda redesigning software. It was hard. It's also time consuming and it's, ex it's expensive. Um, so a few companies like Coca-Cola are able to do something like that by just having local teams in each of, each of these countries that they are targeting and then developing software. But um, normal people are just not able to do that, right? Um, so what many people have done instead to be able to study larger and maybe more representative samples is they've turned to Mechanical Turk. And uh, how many people here know about Mechanical Turk? All right, maybe I should have asked the question the other way around. Who hasn't heard of <laughs> Mechanical Turk before? All right, so I'm going to give you a quick run through what it is. Um, Mechanical Turk is an online labor market. And it's actually um, a comp like it's a, it's it belongs to Amazon, so Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, it's an online ma labor market where people can create hits. Um, those are little tasks, micro tasks, and they can ask workers, and they call them Turkers, to perform these tasks for them. And they usually pay something like um, maybe a cent for a one-minute task, or maybe also maybe it's a thirty-second task. But these are really micro tasks, and only. Um, Usually it's something like label some images or um, get some email addresses, like kind of tedious tasks that the company doesn't want to do themselves. They can outsource and just launch on Mechanical Turk. Now Mechanical Turk is really great because you can just um, launch an experiment on it, pay people, and they will do it. 
So it's only, um, it only allows for online experiments, obviously. Like you can't just um, launch an experiment on it that requires lots of hardware or anything. But for these online experiments, such as like psych psychological experiments, you can just really get a lot of subjects really, really quickly and only pay maybe a dollar per participant. So it's, it's a cheap way to get a lot of data. And a lot of people have published on it. They've also shown that the data is fairly reliable. They are able to replicate in-lab results. And so it's becoming a more and more accepted tool for researchers. Now, for my own research, I've tried to run my experiments on Mechanical Turk, and I actually thought, yay, that's the, that's the platform that will finally enable me to, to explain visual preferences around the world. But then I found out that actually around 81% of the Turkers on Mechanical Turk, so the workers there, are from the US and India. And that has to do with the payment structure of Mechanical Turks. So they pay Turkas, or Amazon only allows to pay Turkas in American, so US dollars and Indian rupees. And you can also get um, Amazon store credit, but that's actually new. And even, even though, I mean, people have to sign up to the platform, they um, often don't have the equipment or the, the tools to actually receive online payments. They might not be interested in getting this payment. Um, so there is a barrier, like an obstacle for people to participate. And that also limits the subject population and makes Turkas maybe less weird than our normal student samples, but they're still fairly weird. OK, so um, I couldn't run my studies on there except if I had only concentrated on India and the US, but I didn't want to just stay with that. So uh, what I did instead is I created my own experiment platform. And I called it Lab in the Wild. Um, we launched it around 2000, in 2012 in July, so a little bit more than two years ago. Um, it's a collaborative effort between me and Christoph Gaios from Harvard University. And um, we talked about it quite a lot um, before we launched this. And we were thinking, like, what do we actually want to get out of this? And it was very much driven by our requirements that we had for this platform, such as my research, um, where I really wanted Lab in the Wild to be a larger scale, so I wanted to recruit many more participants than was previously possible. I definitely wanted a less weird sample. I would have liked to you know, reach a lot of people around the world. And um, obviously, we wanted all that without sacrificing the data quality. So we didn't necessarily uh, want the results to be different as such. Like the, We wanted to be able to replicate in-lab experiments, but then extend them around the world or with different demographic groups. Now, one of the main aspects of Lab in the Wild that is that uh, people don't receive financial compensation when they participate in our experiments. And so this is the main difference between Mechanical Turk and Lab in the Wild. Um, instead, what we do is we provide participants with social comparison. That means we don't give them any financial incentive. We don't give them any cost credit for participation either. And um, this naturally lowers the barrier for partic participation because they don't actually have to sign up. They can just participate as they go along. Like as you serve the web, you come to Lab in the Wild and you just participate in, the, in an experiment and then you go to the next site. Um, so to incentivize participants, we produce a slogan for each of our experiments. And this can be anything like test your social intelligence to how fast is your memory. And each study then has a results page after people have gone through the entire study. And that shows how people compare to others. So this is an example of a results page um, that's very much performance based. So people do this experiment to test their memory and then they want to compare themselves to others. Um, as you can see here, the black line, the top line, is uh, the normal outcome from the in-lab experiment. And that that's basically the hypothesis or the finding that um, the more characters people have to keep in mind, the longer is their response time when they have to recall one of those characters. It's a very standard psychology experiment um, done by Sternberg in, I think, 1966 or something. So it's fairly old. It's uh, fairly established. Um, and we just replicated it and tried to see what, what's going on. And with this participant now, it's not me. But uh, that participant definitely performed much better than the average. Um, lower is faster. So that person was able to recall items from this list of characters much faster than the average participant in the in-lab study. But um, you can see that that way, those participants can compare themselves to others and can see, like, oh, am I maybe better than others? 
in that sense. We also have, uh, we also sometimes provide other feedback, such as value neutral feedback, where we just say, um, your aesthetic preferences compare to this other, to these other people um, in a different way. So that's really not something where it's like, this is good or bad, it's just, you're different in some way. Now, the feedback that we give at the end of these experiments is really what makes Lab in the Wild work. So um, we found that the recruitment on Lab in the Wild is really quite self-perpetuating. Um, that was fascinating to us as well. So it doesn't really require any recruitment from our side. In fact, we haven't really recruited um, actively ourselves. We haven't advertised Lab in the Wild as such. We have a Facebook page now. We didn't used to have that at the start. Uh, we have an email sign-up list. Um, and sometimes we write to this email list. <laughs> I was just saying, I think I've done it once or maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we don't really actively recruit people. Um, but what we did notice is that when we launched Lab in the Wild in 2012, we gave them three experiments. And we noticed that as, as, those, as more and more par participants took part in those experiments, we noticed that there were more and more mentions also of Lab in the Wild in on Twitter, on blog posts, in newspaper articles, and so on. So it, it seems to spread. It was actually fascinating to me to see that newspapers seem to mainly copy of each other, because if one person wrote about it, then another newspaper would also write about it. So <laughs> that's just the way it works, I guess. Um, yeah, but um, I'll just go through our goals again um, that I told you previously about. And I want to talk first about whether Lab in the Wild now actually does enable us to achieve a larger scale than in-lab studies and um, studies on Mechanical Turk. But before I do that, I want to quickly, briefly uh, tell you an example of how surprised we were by the fact that Lab in the Wild does indeed reach a larger scale. So this was an experiment that we conducted last year, and um, it requires participants to click on a number of dots. And now this is a, a like, classic task in human-computer interaction. It's a Fitz law task. We are measuring people's motor ability. Um, it's really, really tedious and boring to do. <laughs> so in lab, people hate doing it. You can even not really get people to do it for payment. It's difficult <laughs> because people just hate it so much. Um, I guess people already spend enough time on the computer anyway. But anyway, so in this task, people are asked to click on this red dot for about five minutes. And um, obviously, the dot is like jumping around. So they just have to follow it around. And <clears throat> the obvious thing is to ask them, what is your pointing ability? And try whether that works. Um, we thought about that for a little bit, but then decided to instead um, train a regression model that would predict people's age based on their um, mouse movements. So this would take into account their mouse movements, their pointing ability, their accuracy, how much they wiggle around, and so on. Now, we changed it to, we guess, can we guess your age? We went to sleep that night. And the next morning, when we woke up, we were surprised to see that several thousands of participants had already taken the experiment. It was all over the internet. Our service had crashed in the meantime. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so just to say it in short, like we were really surprised by it. And that was the first time that we really noticed how it depends on the kind of experiment that we do, how viral it actually goes, and whether it will go viral. So a lot of them are less attractive to people, but this seemed to really catch people's eye. And um, you will later see that a lot of it is also about the accuracy of the prediction. That's a lot, a lot of the reason why people came. Now, in the meantime, in these last two years, we've now um, conducted around 13 studies on Lab in the Wild. I think actually now it's 14. Lab in the Wild has been visited more than 2.5 million times, and we have around 800,000 completed experiment sessions. So this is where people did not drop out at one point during the experiment, which still happens a lot. So like knowing why they do that would be great. We don't at the moment. <laughs> Now, the big question here, I guess, is um, how do people hear about Lab in the Wild? Like, how does this self-perpetuating recruitment actually work? Um, we found that more than 5,000 sites actually link to Lab in the Wild. So if you look at Google Analytics, that's where people come from. And what you can also see from that is that people come to Lab in the Wild from quite diverse backgrounds, right? I mean, they have different interests. They spend their time on imboard.com or some spend their times on some education forum. So it really differs. Um, there's also a lot of international sites in here. I don't even know what they are. I hope they aren't something weird, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> so um, we didn't 
although we looked at these tweets, we, uh, at these uh, sorry, at these uh, referral sources, we didn't we didn't really know what was going on. And so we, in addition, looked at tweets, at people's how people are tweeting about Lab in the Wild to find out what are they actually thinking, why are they coming to Lab in the Wild, and what do they get out of it. In addition, we also looked at participants' comments. Um, so after each experiment, we asked them to just leave feedback. And about 10% of people actually do that and leave us with feedback about how much they enjoyed the experiment or how little they enjoyed it. That happens too. Um, they will actually tell us pretty bluntly if they hated the experiment. So uh, we have all sorts of feedback. But I'll start with some of the tweets um, about why they might come to a lab in the wild. So we found that uh, many people spread the world because um, they seem to have very much altruistic reasons. So some people say participate in these studies because science is cool and it's an interesting insight into yourself. Um, intriguing research, trying to quantify difficult to quantify things, add to their data. Lab in the Wild Org, help advance the design of all sorts of cool things, older people especially welcome. Now this last part was due to the fact that we added a sentence to our feedback page and said, we really need a, a few more older participants to complete this study. And then people seemed to actually recruit older participants and they started coming to our site. So we saw an increase in, in people over 50 after that um, <coughs> who, who actually participated in our experiment. Now, some of the tweets also suggest that people, are, they kind of enjoy the social comparison that we provide. So they say things like, only 3% of people from the United Kingdom share your visual preferences, and they seem to be proud of that. <laughs> or they say, I challenge you all to beat my score of 35 out of 36, post your results here. This is actually in reference to our social intelligence study, and that's a pretty good score. So <laughs> I don't know whether anybody had that score. Um, <clears throat> all right, but then what we really found is, um, that people really like these predictions that we make about them. So if we have an experiment like the age guessing game where they have to click on the dots, they love that. So they say things like, so I live in the wild, guessed my age exactly, science is cool. Or my score, low colorfulness, high complexity, medium color saturation, visual preference test, yes, I like neutral colors. Or, okay, this is sort of spooky, it makes me a little bit more afraid of smart people. It guessed me at 29 and I'm 30. So people seem to like the fact that we could predict their age, that we could predict their color preferences, um, and that it is fairly accurate. Um, to be honest, we have experiments where we are not so accurate, and we see, <laughs> we see that there is uh, more of a decline in participants, like the way they participate. Like they, it doesn't go viral as much as these others. Whether that has to do really with the fact that the prediction accuracy is not as high, or it's other factors we don't know, but it seems like a suggestion on this side. Okay, so this social comparison that our experiments provide, it really seems to be the main reason why Lab in the Wild reaches these high numbers. But um, to do these cross-cultural comparisons at, at large scale, we, like my main goal at least, was really to get a less weird sample, so people around the world ideally. And obviously, language plays a huge role in that, right? To recruit people from all over the, over the world, we should offer Lab in the Wild in languages other than English. And um, to be honest, I underestimated the effort and time it takes to translate Lab in the Wild into 10, 12, 20, 30 languages. It's actually quite a big effort. We've now translated it into Mandarin, and that's the first language that we started with. Um, so it's English and Mandarin at the moment. We are still working on more languages and adding them slowly. Um, but so all this data that I'm reporting on at this point is based on data um, that we collected while Lab in the Wild was only available as an English platform. So if I'm saying we have participants from these countries, they are actually participants who all speak English to a certain extent. So they are able to understand the experiment instructions and so on. But um, if you look at these country, these, this list of countries, this is only um, like the first 26 of um, about 200 countries that we have. <coughs> so people come from more than 200 countries. Um, but those are really the countries that we have pretty stable traffic from. <coughs> and it, it changes a little bit. So um, roughly 37% of these participants come from the US. And then an additional 15% come from the UK. And now these two countries, they usually stay at the top of this list. That doesn't really change much. But um, they provide about 50% of, of the traffic. 
but the rest of the 50% really comes from all over the world and from six continents. Now, we do have some countries where we just have one person and we go like, yay, another country. Um, we hope to really increase that once we have Lab in the Wild translated into different languages because that, I think, is the main reason that's holding it at, the, at this point. Um, I would probably argue this is still not enough diverse, um, but I guess it's a start. Now, Lab in the Wild enables us to reach these more geographically diverse samples, but it also enables us to reach more demographically diverse samples. So even within countries, I think they are more representative of the general population, even though it's not perfect. So on Lab in the Wild participants, self-reported age is um, between 6 and 99 years old. Um, again, it's self-reported. We don't know how much um, we can actually believe this, but we've tried to add verification me mechanisms to this, and it seems to be fairly accurate. Um, even though some people at the end of the experiment do report on that they've shaved a few decades of their age. <laughs> we do get that. Now, the average age of um, participants is 29 years, and that's actually older than participants um, in the conventional in-lab studies that we usually run. But it is a little bit younger, so about two years younger but the, than the, the mean age on Mechanical Turk. And I think one of the reasons is that um, we, depending on the study, when it gets um, launched, sometimes it just gets um, distributed through some forum that has a lot of high school students. So we had a case where we suddenly basically got overrun by, by high school students for one study, and that just really um, skews our population in some senses. Now, we have a fairly diverse education level, although 27% of them, uh, so 73% of them have a college degree or, or higher. So that's obviously not what we really want to achieve, but it is the, the rest of the, so the 27% um, of the sample have a lower education level than these traditional student samples. Um, now again, I think what we need to do in the future is to actually um, try and get more diverse populations interested in this platform and also less educated people. What we've done so far, if we have advertised it on our own social network pages, so if I share it on my own social network, obviously my friends start participating in these, in these uh, studies, and then it spreads through that. But that also means that we do have a lot of people who went to a college or have a PhD because, right, you guys hear about it. I don't necessarily go to schools as much as I go to other research universities. Um, so this is something to work on, I think, where we really have to try and make it even less weird. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the equal data quality point. So that's really was our, one of our main goals where we, where we try to um, assess whether Lab in the Wild would give us data quality that is at least as good as that as collected in lab. And um, this was perhaps the most important point for us to, to despite this uncontrolled environment where you don't have an experimenter sitting next to you or supervising the experiment, where people can get distracted by watching TV or by um, having somebody come into the room and talk to them. Despite all that, we wanted to ensure that we have enough mechanisms and, and that um, people are actually putting as much effort in so that we can produce the same data quality. Now, I'm going, not going through the details of all the experiments that we did. Um, we, did we did run three different experiments where we um, all found that they produced as good um, data quality as in lab. So they also produced the same results. But I'm going to focus again on the visual preference experiment, which is kind of my, um, I guess, the motivation for me to, to build Lab in the Wild in the first place. And I'm going to show you the experiment there and how it actually was able to extend results. So this experiment that I'm describing here is the one on the top right. And now, it's, I think it's actually still at that position. I'm not sure. Maybe it's shuffled around. Um, <clears throat> if you took part in this experiment, you would have been asked to focus on the screen, <coughs> and you would get a first impression of a website. OK, just like that. It just flashes for 500 milliseconds. And then after you saw it for 500 milliseconds, you get to rate that website on a scale from 1 to 9. And you do this 60 times. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you do it, um, so you do it first 30 times, and then there's a short break. And then you see the same websites again 30 times. 
And this is actually to en enable us to do this um, reliability check. Like how consistent are, pe are people's ratings across these two phases of the experiment? And obviously if you are distracted, if you miss these 500 milliseconds in which the screenshot is shown, you're gonna have ratings that are totally off. So that was kind of our mechanism to assess this. And um, interestingly enough, on Mechanical Turk, an experiment like this has actually not been successfully conducted. And I think the reason is that it's financially incentivized and so people have kind of the motivation or have maybe the um, desire to go through the experiment as fast as they can to kind of maximize the money that they get out of it while putting in at like little eff effort. In our case, people want to learn about themselves. And so at the end of this experiment, you would have seen this slide. Um, you would have been presented, there's actually more to it, but this is the main part, where you can compare yourself to people in your country. Now I just selected Afghanistan randomly, don't worry about that. But so it would compare you to your own country and tell you how your preferences correspond to the preferences of somebody else in the country. And there was another thing to it, um, another part where we showed them a website and actually said, so we think that you would like this website. Again, this is this prediction part about it. And people seem to like that. Um, and then they could say yes, no, and we would learn from that again to then refine the experiment. And this is very much value neutral feedback, as you can see. Now we launched this experiment on Love in the Wild and then we collected 2.4 million ratings. Um, this was from almost 40,000 participants and we applied it to 430 websites. So this was our set of stimuli. Now what we did in addition is that uh, we computed 39 image metrics for each website because our goal was to not just say this country likes um, more colorful sites and that's just from us like judging the website, but we really wanted to quantify this and to make it comparable across the entire world. And so with these image metrics, we compute the perceived colorfulness and also the complexity for each of our websites. And we analyzed a lot of other factors like just the type of colors used or the layout and so on. Um, but those two have actually been found to be the largest influence on appeal and we found and we confirmed this in this result again. Now we analyzed these results using mixed effects regression models. And with this setup now, we are able to take a screenshot and then we compute these 39 image metrics. And then after that, we are able to tell you whether you would like this design or not. And we are able to do this for um, around 40 countries in the world for which we had significant numbers of participants who participated in this experiment. And um, we are also able to do this for a lot of different demographic groups. So like different age groups, um, gender, different education levels, and so on. And now again, so our desire here was really to quantify these very vague design guidelines that are out there. So remember when I go back to Rwanda, how I, how I was sitting there and trying to design for these people and I didn't know what they could like. So our goal is to help designers and give them a tool where they can actually um, use our, well, use our tool, feed in a screenshot and then know whether that target population might like it kind of to avoid this humiliation that I experienced when they didn't like my design at all. Um, now, what we did at this end with all this data was that we calculated the level of colorfulness and, vi um, and visual appeal that resulted in peak appeal for specific demographic groups. So we really wanted to know like, what's the exact colorful level, colorfulness level and complexity level that um, gets rated as highest. And so, this is an example of the two best fit lines for the United States. And um, it just tells you on the x-axis is the colorfulness and the complexity ratings. So to the right, it gets higher um, in terms of it's more complex, it's more colorful. And then on the y-axis, we have the visual appeal. And um, you can see from this that the average per person in the US likes these kind of medium complex sites. So not, not too simple, not too, um, complex and they really quite like, um, quite dislike um, these, these very much colorful ones. And this finding is actually what corresponds to previous work in this area. So this was already known. A lot of people knew that this is kind of the preference of North Americans and Canadians are actually like really similar to Americans in their preferences, what we, in our findings. But in our study, we now found that um, this isn't really what everybody likes. 
So again, we have the US here. But then Germany um, might not be surprising. People in Germany like websites with a low colorfulness and complexity much more than in the US. And they dislike the colorful websites more than people in the US. And I guess for me, that kind of confirms that my preferences are normal. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, you can see that every day in Germany, actually, if you go to websites there, they're fairly simple in comparison to American, North American websites. Now, we have countries like Macedonia that are totally out of control. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> don't really know what's going on here. Like, they really seem to like very much colorful websites. Um, and we have also, it's actually interesting in this, um, what we could see from this data is also that other countries such as Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, all of those are um, part of the former Yugoslavia. They had very much similar preferences and this cluster was quite different from other countries. So, you know, they have a similar history, similar culture, similar migration history too. It might actually be that this can be seen in visual preferences. At least this is what we found in our data. <coughs> And then we have something like Hong Kong, where you can see that the um, colorfulness is very much, like it doesn't really matter, it seems. But whatever you choose might be right. So that's a pretty much straight line. Now we, had, we have similar graphs like this um, for 43 countries for which we had more than 1,000 ratings. So this is really the, the number of countries that we usually get enough data from so that we can conduct these cross-cultural analysis. Uh, we're trying to obviously get more countries and like more data from each country, but that's a bit of a process, I guess, at this moment. Now, in a similar way, we can also make predictions about gender, age, um, and education level, and I think that's now out of the scope of this talk to just go into detail about this. But um, just, yeah, just um, to get, yeah, I guess my point here is just that um, this is the first time really that we're able to collect this data at this detail and talk about specific demographic groups and what they like and also geographic groups. Now, just get to get back to the issue of data quality, um, we were obviously wondering whether this data quality on Lab in the Wild is still good enough, seeing that it's such an uncontrolled and unsupervised environment. And what we did to, to look at this was uh, we compared the consistency between these participants' ratings that I talked about previously. So we had phase one, phase two in this experiment. And we ran Pearson correlations for each participant and compared the distribution of the correlation coefficients with those of the previous in-lab study. And this in-lab study was actually conducted by somebody else. So um, we just tried to replicate it and look at like, are our participants as reliable as the in-lab participants in their subjective ratings? And again, keep in mind, this is, uh, an environment where people can get it distracted in between. And we actually know from people's feedback in the comments after the experiment that they have things happening like their cat is sitting on a keyboard, or their mother is walking in, or they have a friend coming on a chat client, or there's suddenly um, some browser window popping up and asking them to download some software. So, you know, people are living in these distracted environments and we can't really prevent them from that. But despite that, we actually found that participants provide really reliable subjective ratings, and they are as reliable as people in lab. And this is, um, of course, significant. So um, in some cases, we even found that um, participants were providing much more consistent ratings than participants in lab, which was surprising to us. Now, we also replicated these other two previous, um, like other, two other previous in lab studies on Lab in the Wild. I briefly mentioned that before. And for those, we also found that the data quality was as good on Lab in the Wild as it was in Lab before. So just to summarize this, with Lab in the Wild, um, we are able to collect more data and um, participants are usually less weird than previously possible, so previously in Lab studies. And they're actually also less weird than people on Mechanical Turk. And now we're also able to accurately replicate in-lab study results. Um, so hopefully that shows that Lab in the Wild is a feasible tool to conduct these kinds of studies at least. Not all studies, of course, but these kinds of studies are definitely feasible to run. Um, and I guess the example of the visual preference experiment shows that we kind of need these studies to explore how people differ around the world and to design for different demographic and geographic groups. And this is only possible because Lab in the Wild now has on average 1,000 participants a day. 
So they just come to the site, participate, and we can collect the data fairly quickly. There are still a few downsides. We still can't um, really predict how many people will like an experiment and do it. So once we put an experiment online, we don't actually know how many people will take it, and we don't know how fast they will take it, like how quickly it will take on. So that takes a while, and these are all things we need to resolve over the next few years, decades, we'll see. <laughs> Um, at the end of this talk, I would like to briefly mention um, that Lab in the Wild is actually only possible because so many participants contribute their time and um, they're willing to contribute. And now, first of all, I personally would have not really thought that um, participants would be willing to do this, like would be willing to volunteer the time and that so many people would do this. And it's actually not just that they just um, participate in the experiments. It's really that they write us a lot of emails. I haven't actually received physical letters yet, but <laughs> I'm getting a lot of emails. Um, so what, what they usually say are things like, why didn't you improve the experiment design in this direction? Why didn't you do this? Um, so they provide a lot of suggestions. At the same time, they also often want to know um, how a result can be interpreted. So a lot of people are um, just curious to hear more about the research. Some people are actually also concerned about their result and think like, what can they do to improve their memory, for example. Um, we also get a lot of feedback on technical issues. So for example, browser compatibility issues that we hadn't foreseen. And that's actually crucial to running these experiments online. Like we really need these people to tell us, um, you have a bug here, it doesn't work in Explorer 6 or something. <laughs> Internet Explorer 6 is like one of those biggest issues in the world, I think. Anyway. <laughs> um, Right, so, so we really have to rely on these people um, to help us with these technical suggestions and improvements and, and just telling us about issues. What we've also seen is people coming to us and telling us about um, they can help with recruitment, for example. Um, we've even had people translating our experiments and posting it on their own blog pages so that people in their country can participate in our experiments, which I thought was really nice. I don't know what they said, like, I don't know what the experiment description actually was, but um, it's kind of a nice gesture. Uh, we've also had people offering us uh, bitcoins. <laughs> so we haven't accepted that yet, but I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. There are definitely a lot of people who want to help. And so this is one of the major future directions for me um, to look into how can we involve these participants more. So one of the biggest goals for me is to not just take participants' data. I really want to have, give them a learning opportunity. And um, you know, at the moment, we are providing them with something to learn that they can learn about themselves. But it's limited. They could learn so much more. I could tell them more about the current status of HCI research, for example, or about psychology research. So doing that in the future is really one of the biggest goals, um, looking into how we can work with them and collaborate with them on making experiments be better, maybe analyzing the data. I'm also interested in looking into um, whether we can involve them in um, so interpreting findings that are not really um, logical for us, or where we find clusters in the data, for example, where we don't really know what's going on. Maybe some people who are from a certain country might actually know more about that country, and so they might be able to tell us why this outlier is happening or why, this, uh, why we find that some countries cluster in that way. So things like this is really, I think, an opportunity for us researchers to involve normal citizens in science. So that being said, thank you so much for attending this talk. And I guess the take home message is that Lab in the Wild makes research a little bit less weird. And thanks for listening. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Professor Milgram. Um, I assume you get asked this often. Um, what, what are the implications if you have to go for, for getting research ethics approval in these kinds of experiments? Right. Yeah, so <laughs> I could tell a lot of stories about this. So <laughs> um, we have a normal ethics approval at the moment. So people, before they, they come to the experiment itself, they come to Lab in the World, then they click on the experiment, then they consent. Um, so we have to do that, we give them a whole page. I think it puts a lot of people off, to be honest. So I would love to have a workaround for that. But at the moment, we tell people about the experiment, what they can expect. Um, we tell them that they can close the browser window at any time, and so on. Um, one limitation is we aren't, at the moment, able to track participants because of ethics issues. Um, 
we're trying to get a workaround to that because it really limits us uh, in knowing whether people come back to do the same experiment. So for example, in the memory experiment, people come to improve their memory. So they come multiple times and we ask them, and so they hopefully truthfully answer that they have participated in the experiment before. I guess they have no reason to lie, but it would be much better if we could track them that way and know which experiment they've already participated in. There could also be a, some degree of deception on your part. Like for example, when you tell people where they stand relative to the rest of their country, hmm. that's not going to mean very much for the first few participants. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, right. So we, uh, yeah, right. So we bootstrap that data usually using either related work. So we often hunt for literature that has some hints about comparative things. Um, sometimes if it's, if it's really, if we don't have any cross-cultural data, we would just do it on an average. And then we just tested with the first 100 people. We actually have used our Facebook page to recruit people for that. So we have posted on there. We don't have any data yet, but if you participate, then we can use your data to launch the experiment later. Um, we've also done things just like in our lab. There's like six people have done the experiment, and then we use that average. We lower it slightly <laughs> and then put it online. I guess that's really like the deception part that it's not like, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. Bad. Right. It's yeah. I feel a little bit bad about it, but not too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. So if you have big sample sizes, can you just say throw our, throw out participants so your data is less weird? Like if you have eighty thousand, you could throw out a bunch of young people if it's biasing your results. In the experiment. Right. I can totally do that. It always hurts a little bit. I find throwing our data. Um, no, we can definitely do that. Um, I think the problem is more that from like the countries that I would really like to study are usually like African countries, um, and we don't really get much data from there yet. So there are no participants <coughs> coming from there yet. So throwing out the rest wouldn't really make that much sense for now. But yeah, it's, we can do that. We can also account for the skew in the sample in our analysis later. That's what we usually do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a great talk. Thank you, Al. Thanks. You made the data less weird, but it's skewed in another direction right. that those internet users who are willing to participate right. online. Yes. Uh, so it's. And we have free time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, connecting to the other questions about ethics, uh, mm -hmm. we were doing at the University of Pennsylvania a study, cross cultural study, on how Facebook is used in a repressive environment, Iran, and awesome. outside of Iran. But one of the major things that you cannot look at the IP to decide whether the people are coming from which country. Right. So it was completely limiting the way that you see where the people are coming and it was not something that we could negotiate right. uh, ethics wise. But the questions that you can ask here that were you designed them in a way was easy to do, but more complex cultural questions about like how secure you feel when you are using circumvention tools. Do um, you think that there might this mechanism gonna be successful for such questions? Or those more complex um. right. so that's a good question I'm not entirely sure my instinct would tell me that I think we can go to a certain so we, I think we can run experiments that have a cognitive that that require a certain cognitive effort we've done this definitely before so I think people are willing to also do that if they feel like they're getting something back if it's like privacy sensitive questions or questions where they feel maybe like maybe scared to answer it honestly, I don't know, but it seems like a difficult thing in general to do online, I guess. Yeah. We haven't tried it. So <laughs> but that study sounds really fascinating actually. Yeah. Sure. So I work um, in social services um, and I can sort of see this as being used in shelters, mm -hmm. shelters where uh, some of the long term residents there participate in might be able to find out about them and they gain you know, a lot of fear skills or something. Um, do you see an application in this, of this, in, in that area without the financial benefits that maybe uh, Amazon and Amazon mechanical certified? So you mean uh, kind of providing this just for a certain population and changing it around a little bit to make it fit? Right. Definitely. I think, yeah, that would be great. I mean, I also think that 
I, I honestly think that people can learn from it too. So I think um, it might actually be interesting for those people to use. Because I'm thinking that apart from the researchers right. too. Because because you would get participants in North America, but they wouldn't be part of the weird um, uh, subgroup. Right, but they would be so interesting in a different way. Right? Right, they would exactly. still add to the sample. Yeah. And it's not like maybe that came across a little bit harsh, but I really want all these countries. <laughs> um, my collaborator, Christoph Gallias, for example, is much more interested in different age groups. He doesn't care about culture that much. So it's, it's really, um, right, like, I, I think it just adds, it makes, it makes research just so much more generalizable if you have different groups of people that have different interests, that have not just different demographics, it's just diverse people in general. So yeah, any group, like, send them all our way. <laughs> Uh, I don't know who was first. I'm not sure anymore. I can't keep track. You'll have to negotiate. Uh, <laughs> I think Nat. Nat? Oh, no. We'll do Nat. You're too polite. We'll do you. No. I said a quick question about age. So, when you collect data, So it is actually, yeah, it makes it much, much better. And in fact, the initial, so this was a bit difficult because we had so many participants that came so quickly to that experiment that we weren't really able to retrain on one. <laughs> um, but the error, I, I actually don't really remember, but I think it was only off by a few years. And um, it was a little bit skewed towards people in their 30s. So it was really good at predicting like whether you're 31 or 32. But it wasn't so good at predicting whether you're 60 or 62. It's, it's just because we had so many more people that were that were younger. We didn't have enough people in the older ranges. Yeah. Um, I think there were two more questions over on this side. Yeah. But then, yeah. Uh, we came from the Japan yesterday, and I'm very much happy that I, our flag is there, <laughs> and flag and Japanese flag is there. Yeah. And I uh, also invested that here. Yeah, Not many. Many. Yeah. So, uh, oh, some of them. 40,000 participants all together, it's a big, very, very big data indeed. Sorry, what the? You are, you are collecting the participants. Yeah. It's 40,000, so many people indeed. Yeah. I think you have lots of participants. Yeah. Oh, so oh, right, from Japan, do you mean? No, 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 you, you've shown it's a different chart with a visual appear and mm -hmm. uh, carefulness and the complexity. Each country is different. Mm -hmm. But you can put in a one, one sheet, one chart, two protein, applying the first protein analysis that can be things you might use. You can use one chart. Oh, you country, mean? Country, country. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But you mean like the best kind of design for mm -hmm. each country? Or what do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In one chart. In the yeah. country, 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 it's, uh, it's uh, it, it applying the CA first on its analysis. You can put such kind of things versus uh, colorfulness or complexity in one chart. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we've done that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that something we should do? Is that uh, it, it must be a very interesting. Uh, oh, right. Result, I think. Yeah. yeah, we My just put it all in the model and yeah. computed like all these. Like we don't, we know that they are. Like for example, if they are statistically significant, we do know that, but we haven't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but mm -hmm. well, that might be something that yeah, we should talk about. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we found that. Have you thought of the possibility that there might be some interaction between the method you're using and the countries you're using it in? Like for example, you showed the presentation that was 500 milliseconds. So you standardize the method to get a certain set of results, but maybe mm -hmm. the 500 millisecond would be different if you for different countries. So some countries that like high complexity, you might get a different set of results if you gave them more time. Oh, less okay. Time. Yeah, that's a really good point. So by standardizing, right. you're standardizing, but you may be affecting your results. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I actually have that's a new point for me never heard that before, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's completely right. I mean, we actually did that to avoid that people engage with the content as well. 
Um, but yes, we can. First of all, we can only now say something about the first impression, not about like long-term appeal and so on. But you're right that I think we what we found is that um, some people seem to definitely like more complex sites than others, and I I keep wondering it's because they maybe just um, intuitively know that that's going to be usable for them too. So in that ca maybe they can just perceive it better. Um, but so yeah, maybe maybe if we change that to a minute or something. We've tried with shorter durations and it didn't really work, just because people couldn't see it fast enough. Um, trying it with different durations is definitely the point. Yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> it's actually easy to do. So yeah, just tweaking that little parameter. Great, thanks. It's awesome. Well, the five second test is really common. Oh, five, five seconds. Second for, yeah. But then you can really already read everything. I mean, right? Yeah. Just, um, right. Yeah, that's true. A little bit replicates. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned in the beginning that lab is not a little part of your research. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just talk about like a past or ongoing project that stemmed from, you know, this sort of stemmed from lab. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll just take that aesthetics project because we've already heard about it so much. Um, I'm actually currently taking that and developing a kind of, I call it a cultural lens. So it's like a browser overlay. And as you surf, um, the website will rearrange itself to adapt to your own preferences. So we're doing that at the moment. But what we're also doing is um, we are, this aesthetics experiment that I've talked about, if you take it now, it's actually different from what it was because we are changing the background um, depending on what we think. So we have different conditions of the background. Um, and we're asking people to not just rate 60 websites, but we're asking people to rate as many websites as they want. And we tell them that the results will get better. You shouldn't take it anymore now, by the way. Now you know too much about it. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're asking people to just rate as many websites as they want, and the results will get better the more they rate. And we're looking at how much the aesthetics, so the background of that experiment, just the visual design, uh, influences how kind of how willing they are to rate a lot of websites. And the the first results already show that people are more likely to drop out if the if the background of the experiment is not as we predicted to be optimal for them. So they they're dropping out earlier and they're not rating as many. Um, we also see that people share more information if the background is more corresponding to their own visual preferences, which we use our model for, like we use our model to predict their preferences in the first place. And then. So things like this is what we're doing. Really my overall vision in the long term is to just give people an optimal website design. It doesn't have to be just a website, it can be any user interface, it can be a mobile phone or whatever, but it should be appealing, it should be usable, intuitive at first sight. <laughs> um, it's a, Pretty long term mission, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>